I would say that undergraduates uh, sometimes find it very difficult to work out why it is they are doing research methods. They sometimes think, well, if I need to know how to construct a questionnaire or how to analyse data, I'll read about it as and when I need to do it, so like for a project. Um, and so they don't see the point in covering, you know, in 20 lectures, the whole gamut of uh, methods, analytic approaches, and so on. Postgraduates tend to be much more attuned to the case for being um, instructed in the, in the variety of methods. So nowadays I don't teach undergraduates, mm -hmm. but, but I think the, the approach has been um, to explain to undergraduates what different methods have contributed to the understanding of sociology. So mm -hmm. to work backwards from research that's been done, look at the methods that were involved and use that as a springboard for saying, look how, look how significant that's been for our knowledge mm -hmm. of the world around us. Postgraduates, as I say, tend to, tend to particularly those who are studying for a PhD, they, they're, they're less concerned about those issues. They're much more easily persuadable in many ways. Um, well, I think um, my own proposal, I think, over the years has been that methods should not just be taught on methods modules, but uh, I think the crucial thing is to persuade colleagues to also refer to methods when they're dealing with substantive issues and generally to build up a more cooperative approach towards the teaching of methods so that methods aren't just dumped you know, on one mm. particular module. Well, I suppose the biggest challenge is to um, get people um, to engage with something that they're not comfortable with, really, kind of, immediately. Mm. That starts with kind of the, the dentist being not even um, really very, um, you know, aware of, you know, that you could rate the evidence in some things that look very shiny on paper mm. in dental update or something that may actually be quite shoddy research. And sometimes people get it, sometimes they don't. And you, you always get the one or mm. two who say, oh my God, I always thought I could just read it up in there. And now I find that it's all kind of, it, it could be kind of no good at all. Mm -hmm. And so the only really challenging one is if you are in the general research methods module and you have your qualitative corner. Mm -hmm. And then you get people who are saying, well, but what about... Um, generalizability and repeatability and mm. and what about you have a, you have a tiny sample size how do you how do you kind of decide on your sample size well i work for a research group at oxford university where mm. we're a, a group of qualitative mm. researchers and we collect people's experiences of different health conditions and we mm. film our interviews mm. and we publish these experiences online at health talk online and youth health talk mm and the lay summaries of the research are interspersed with video extracts from the interviews. And this is a freely available resource. And I've taught qualitative research methods now for several years to undergraduate and postgraduate mm. students and health professionals. And I've found that using this resource within the teaching has been really important to students. I found it very valuable. Um, we use the video extracts to illustrate different parts of the research mm -hmm. process and we use the data to actually analyse, to demonstrate analysing mm -hmm. data to students. Um, and I think the, the way students can see real life examples of, of qualitative interviews being done sort of exposes the messiness of the process mm -hmm. in a good way and encourages them to engage more critically with the process. And I think the student feedback has always been that they've really appreciated this, this close mix between practical experience, that, that the people teaching the courses are all mm -hmm. researchers and the theory and, and, and um, mm -hmm. sort of epistemological underpinnings to that process. Mm -hmm. We use the resources mm -hmm. slightly differently, so in terms of the undergraduates we're, we're presenting more of a generic picture mm -hmm. of re qualitative research methods, and so it's at a slightly um, more generic level. And then with the postgraduates and health professionals I would say are similar, in that they want a more in-depth understanding, mm -hmm. so then we go deeper into the data, deeper into the video extracts, we have quite sort of, quite um, mm -hmm. heated discussions about debates around qualitative research methods of which there's mm -hmm. quite a few contentious issues around validity and transferability and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So we use these materials really as a discussion point with the postgraduates, mm -hmm. whereas with the undergraduates it's slightly more to, to, to get them to see what it's like to do research. Mm -hmm. So there is a slight difference. Face-to-face -face, uh, can only really yeah. deal with the core issues. Mm -hmm. 
and to develop more skills in particular. I think you need supplementary materials and luckily there are lots of good ones around and so it, uh, it's essential to use them, I think, and to get students to use them and also judge their own quality as they go through so they've got to learn that some online sources are better than others. As we said before, I think uh, as supplementals really initially and uh, they are quite useful. They're, they're useful for the bits of method courses that require skills to be developed but they're not so good for things like explaining the context and purpose and values of, of research methods. I think that's the other issue. Um, teaching students academic values, you know, that academics mean something different by argument than they might do or sample or uh, evidence. So I think those issues come up too in methods courses and uh, that's really where face-to-face -face is probably better. Um, I'm speaking sort of on behalf of, of NCRM and, and the experience there is, is, is to try and uh, particularly provide resources for advanced methods teaching. So mm. there's a number of uh, efforts, if you like, in the different nodes that have tried to do that. We mm. have um, tried to, to make online resources available for teaching multi-level modelling. And those resources have tended to be um, online courses, Moodle courses, and uh, other downloadable resources that are available. For a lot of what's available is for basic methods and a lot of it is, is basic summary material. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to push the area of advanced methods and mm -hmm. we're trying to make more uh, material available for mm -hmm. advanced methods. Um, and I think then to try and address specific questions and, and, and address them in a way that, mm -hmm. that will take learners from a sort of a beginning to an end in the mm -hmm. process. So sort of step-by-step -step guides. I teach the courses along with three or four other mm. colleagues and we all use resources quite differently so I don't think there's one framework we mm. use. I just think it's the general being able to draw on these resources quite mm. easily and students themselves then go away and, and visit the mm. website themselves and I just think it just demystifies the process to them as well. I think it sort of shows that it's not a neat easy process that, mm. that's very simple. It shows the sort of complexity involved in it all. So I definitely think it's transferable. Mm -hmm. Um, without a doubt. And there's about 2,000 mm -hmm. video extracts mm -hmm. that are done by probably a range of about 15 interviewers who use slightly different approaches, slightly different methodological approaches. So if you look through the website you can see different examples of interviewing techniques mm -hmm. for example. You can see examples when rapport is slightly um, mm -hmm. not well established. There's all sorts of different examples that you can mm -hmm. see very good examples of, of, of a very engaged reflexive researcher mm -hmm. asking particular questions mm -hmm that's generated really rich, in-depth mm. data and at the same time less robust examples. Mm. So I think it's the range of, of mm. examples on there that, that you can sort of present to mm. students and, and get students to reflect on what's happened in that mm. extract. Mm. And again with the analysis as well, you've, there's such a rich database of, of, of you know, data mm. for students to grapple with. And then you've got the finished project in terms of the published research we have mm. in peer-reviewed journals. So students are able to see this yeah. whole process through to the end. Mm. And I quite like getting students to think we go through a set of data that has had a published paper, yeah. and, but encourage the students to think about how would they have analysed the data, what mm. different findings would they have come up with. Mm. And again, I think it helps them engage mm. uh, more holistically with the process. Mm. Um, my own view is that I've, I tend to use web materials, online materials, purely as supplementary. Mm. They're there to um, enhance my lectures, to enhance the material that I'm trying to get across. I, I don't feel that there's, um, that you can leave students just to kind of go in search of these materials and for that to be the sole source of their understanding of research methodology. It needs to be backed up mm. by you as a teacher. I think sometimes, I, th I think sometimes perhaps we, perhaps we expect too much of online materials. Mm. We've, we've got to recognise that those materials have got to be dovetailed with ongoing, uh, mm. on, ongoing modules mm. and programmes and so on. Because again with teaching I think that issue of time is key. You have all sorts of good intentions about adding different resources to the course, wanting to um, include certain things, but there's a limited number of weeks in, in the academic year for you to actually deliver that material and you've got limited time to actually prepare it. So having somewhere that as a teacher you could go to and know, okay, well here's a list of resources about using visual methods and ethical issues to do with that in social policy or whatever. 
I suppose I'd like to see a well-organised, well-referenced, well-signposted set of resources to save me trawling from the start. So I knew I could go to one place and be able to see what's available um, clearly and have some form of um, trust in the materials, I suppose. But, yeah, I'm not quite sure because I still think you have to judge things yourself all the time. Yeah. So I quite like that layer that somebody's, somebody's defined this set of resources as good resources in inverted commas, but I would still mm. be quite um, subjective about looking at them. It would be great to have that kind of one space where you know you might be able to find something. Yeah, like it's kind of, kind of searching by keywords mm. and having a kind of consistent site that works on some kind of template so everything sort of looks and feels the same so it's not these kind of bitty things all over the place that you're trying to figure like we've been talking about you know the value and how useful it is and how good it is and who and who wrote it which would also help with the citing issues if you've then got a space to go to. The kinds of resources um, need to be highlighted to a significant extent I think as ones that are particularly appropriate to undergraduates and ones that are particularly appropriate to postgraduates because there are issues of level, there are issues of need as well so I think that in a sense the space when we talk about a space there are probably several spaces and those spaces need to be attuned to the needs of different groups of students. Where there is a large collection of resources and it is classified and stratified and there's some agreement about uh, suitability and also they're, they're very diverse you know because again I don't think that one system necessarily works. Some people like video and others like uh, things like Xerti or PDFs so a variety of material, but also some way of finding your way through them, I think, is crucial. The portal model, where um, there are properly indexed sort of different subject area interests, different methodological approaches, different ethical issues, um, categorised in such a way that you can draw on generic resources if that's necessary and needed for your course, but you can also draw on uh, subject specific or particular methodological issues um, and have everything in one space so you're not having to trawl through the web to look for particular resources to try and find different things. And the, yeah. the basic structure I'd like to see is a collection of collections. I'd, I'd like to see a lot of resource mm. devoted to providers of resources being able to, in a sense, set out a shop front more effectively so, so that basically they can pull together what they're producing mm -hmm. and present it in, in, a, in a clearer uh, way and, and mm -hmm. present it in a way that's easier to find mm -hmm. and then I would like to then have some way of tying those together or directing people. I think a lot of people who are looking for resources uh, will go and they may, they may be produced by an, a particular member of staff in an institution but finding it and mm -hmm. finding it through the front door of their website if you like um, mm -hmm. is often quite difficult. So I'd like to see something that allows uh, providers to uh, do more to, to, to set out a stall of what they're providing, I think would be the key thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see a gateway. I'd like to see some kind of um, a, a site that people could go to that would not only provide them with jumping off points to particular methods or mm -hmm. analytic approaches, but would help them to see what the, the role uh, of those particular methods and so on would play in some kind of wider research project yeah. um, so you could so you could divide up the methods according to um, you know stage in the research process mm -hmm. and so on but the other point is that I think it also needs to be linked to uh, people's needs and expectations, you know, so I think uh, if, there, if there was some way of devising the gateway so that mm. it could be geared to the needs, say, of PhD students yeah. as against a second year undergraduate, mm. then I think that would be, that would be really handy. But, the, but it's, it's a very big ask, it's a mm. very, it, 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 it would involve a lot, but currently that's what's missing. Mm. We do need something that people can go to, that instructors can go to, rather than, rather than rely quite so much as we do on word of mouth, mm. Googling, happening to come across things as we're 
going through the internet. I think it would be handy to have something that was a starting point, a springboard for a variety of web materials.